Hey guys, this is Billy from Adult Cello. Happy Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving Day, and in that spirit, I want to say thank you to you for all of you who have liked my videos, commented on them, subscribed to my channel. It really means so much to me. It, I get so much pleasure out of reading the personal stories and the you know struggles and successes of all these adult learners, there's so many of us. Um, I started this as a pandemic project and I didn't know what to expect. I've been so completely overwhelmed and pleasantly surprised with, I had a feeling there were a lot of us out there, but I'm just thrilled that I can give some advice or you know, just so provide some entertainment or some content that helps because there's not really a lot of stuff geared towards adult learners and there needs to be more adult learners of cello. It's a wonderful instrument and it's never too late to learn. So what I'm going to do today, a little different, I've, I have kind of like this stockpile of emails that I've been planning to answer um, in a video form and it's primarily people who've reached out who are earlier on in their cello journey, they found me and they're kind of wondering more about my actual personal journey and how I navigated the path I, I kind of got through because, it, you know, obviously if you start as an adult beginner, it's going to be a little non-standard. So that's what we're going to cover today. I have a list of questions here on my phone. It'll also be maybe a chance to just kind of know a little bit more about me and my story if that interests you. So uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so right now and let's just get started. So the first question is, um, so how far into playing was I when I started seriously considering making this a profession? And then after how long um, of playing did I go to university, you know, go back to school for it? Okay. I should preface this with the fact that I, I tend to be an impulsive person, <laughs> but I was, I'd been playing for about three weeks and I played and my teacher at the time was, she just seemed kind of stunned and she said, you know, I, this sounds crazy, but you could maybe be professional, you know, if you really worked at it. That changed everything for me because that was almost like now I had permission to dream. Even within three weeks, I was pretty obsessed. I just, I had already been consuming cello music on YouTube and reading and I was just totally obsessed with classical music and cello. And her saying that at the time, I, I got very focused right away and I was just like, I can't believe it. This is amazing that I, it's not like the door hasn't been shut on me. So I, I got, and I started practicing, my practice time ramped way up. So about a month in, I had decided that I really wanted to go professional and I was just going to set that goal and then just go for it. Um, with the understanding that it was going to be a very long, arduous journey and that, you know, there's no guarantees in life, but that was my goal. So about a month in, which is probably sounds crazy, but at the time it made sense, I swear. Um, in terms of going back to school, okay, so let me just, I was taking private lessons and then I realized if I really want to be serious about this, I need to understand music fundamentals, I need to understand music theory, I don't want to just know how to play cello and that's it. I want to understand music. That was kind of the other reason I got into cello is to understand music better. So what I did, I found uh, the local community college, signed up for Music One, Fundamentals of Music, and I, you know, that was maybe three months in I started that class and it was, you know, general admission, you could just get in if you have a high school diploma. And so I went to that and then as I was going through those kind of first beginner classes, um, the teachers sort of, I would pull the ones I liked aside and just talk to them about my situation. They mentioned there was an applied program, so I applied for that nine months into playing, and I got in because, you know, obviously I told them that I've been playing for nine months. Otherwise, they would have been very shocked because, I, you know, I'd been only playing nine months. It sounded like it. So I got in. So technically, about a year into playing cello, I was in junior college as a full-time student going through their applied music program. Um, it was like in terms of over your head, the great thing about that program was you join the orchestra and then the repertoire, 
you know, I picked it with my teacher. So we just, it was basic, you know, it was junior college level, but I wasn't playing junior college level repertoire right away. But my growth, I just grew very quickly because I was just suddenly immersed into all these like small groups, that, like chamber music for fun, for performances, and then the orchestra. So that was a year in, I did two years there. And then I transferred over to uh, Cal State Northridge. Um, and then I did two years there. It sounds like a prison sentence. It, what didn't, it wasn't like that at all. I, I did my time, two years, right? And then I graduated with a second bachelor's in cello. So it, it happened kind of quick, but it was, it seemed pretty organic because I reached out to teachers and that's kind of how I figured out, oh, there is a program. I didn't even know what applied program was. Like you just, and then they talked to other faculty to like, this kid is, he's really obsessed with cello. He hasn't been playing long, but I think he would do well in this. So I, a lot of what I'm going to say today about my personal journey is making the most of opportunities and making opportunities happen and making them sort of exist in the first place. So, you know, with other kids who grow up playing an instrument and then they go to college for it, there's kind of like a stream you feel, you know, and you just, you just hop into that stream and you get carried along because there's just this, you know, this whole track set up for you and you just advance along it and then you end up where you end up. So with us, it's a little different. You have to, you know, reach out to people, not hound people, but, you know, be persistent and figure out what you need and then how to go about getting it. All right, so here's another question. Was it good timing to study when you did? Going back um, where, you know, what with the current level I was at um, and then with the economy. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that means like the, the world economy. Um, I'll talk about the second part later, but in terms of timing, I think it was a great time. I was always sort of reaching for the next thing. I was definitely underqualified most of the time. Like when I got into junior college, I've been playing for a year. That's nothing compared to most, you know, musicians who've been growing up with their instrument. But I really liked that. And I actually, that was a piece of advice I would give. If possible, I always tried to put myself in a situation where I was the worst player in a group, um, especially chamber music, but also, you know, orchestra. If everyone around me is a better player and more experienced, uh, more in tune, <laughs> you know, that they're, you kind of get the rub from their level and it brings you up in my experience. So I've, before going on, I should put a, cov a caveat there. W you don't want to be the worst person by miles and miles in a group because that can be very frustrating for the other players. It can be very depressing for you. And it, it, you know, then it's more just, you feel very out of place and it doesn't help anyone. But if you can be able to keep up, but lower in, in skill and technique and, you know, experience than the people around you, they will boost you like you couldn't imagine. Okay, so the timing was perfect for getting into junior college and then getting in, transferring to college. I had so much ground to make up, but that's what I was looking for. I needed, in my eyes, I needed a fast track to get going, okay? So I loved being less experienced, but I was also assuming that I was gonna be able to keep up and then eventually, ideally, you know, maybe even pass some people as I just like worked harder. In terms of the economy, I think it's kind of like, okay, when is a good time? You know, I've got a job, I'm trying to figure out. If, if you're deciding that you're gonna make a change, you've been playing for a short amount of time, but you're just obsessed with cello, I think you have to be realistic in the sense that this is not a practical decision you're making. It's oftentimes, it's a beautiful decision. I'm glad I made the decision I made, but it wasn't because I'm like, this is for job security, this is gonna work out great, I'm sure of it. So in terms of the economy or like your, your life situation, once I decided I really wanted to make this happen, there's no time like the present. So I just wanna get going, get started. And, and that was kind of my attitude, is just jump into things. 
yeah, don't think like, oh, well, if I wait a year, I'll be better than I'd start college at a higher level. That I see merit in thinking that way, but for me, it was like, how quickly can I get into this program? How can I get these teachers to talk to me and, and to educate me? I just need to go, 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 go. So that was my approach and it, I think it worked well because it also influenced me. There were times, another big thing for kind of making your own way in this is that you have to sort of be able to critique yourself along your journey and find solutions for problems because no one else is going to do that. So what I mean is when I got to uh, university, I was with a teacher and I kind of at a certain point, I felt myself plateau and I was just being honest with myself, you know, the amount of hours I'm putting in and the amount of progress I'm making, those two don't look like they're, um, you know, a good rate, a good ratio. So I went and found another teacher and started studying with uh, like a world-class teacher at a local conservatory here in LA. And I was studying with him privately whenever he would let, whenever he had space. It turned out to be about every three or four weeks. I did that for a number of years. And those lessons were so critical. It really helped me get past the plateau I'd hit and then just kind of open doors for what was possible for me, technically speaking on the cello. No one was gonna, do that for me though. I could have just finished my time at that university and then, oh look, I have the same degree as I do now. So it wouldn't, on paper, nothing would be changed, but I wouldn't have advanced as a player. So I was always very careful to, f to try to see, evaluate myself, I guess, and figure out, am I progressing steadily? If not, is it something I can change about myself or do I need to change like the, the input I'm getting? You know, maybe change teachers, figure something out because, you know, time is of the essence, okay? Um, okay, kind of a connected question. When did you consider yourself a professional cellist? This is a really good question and it, to this day, it's still something that like brings up a little bit of awkwardness or discomfort just because it's such a loaded question to me uh, in this regard because as a musician you can make your living in so many different ways and so I mean if you make all your money in playing cello for example and you live comfortably and you and everything's fine you're you're how could you not be a professional cellist that doesn't necessarily always mean that you're a, a top level player, that even though you're getting, you're making all your money as a cellist. So there's kind of so many ways to look at what professional means. Um, there's the, you know, technical level, you know, like I think basically if you're in a major orchestra and you have a tenured position, that's probably one of the easiest ways to say you're a professional cellist. Um, or if you're a soloist who's touring around, yeah, you're, <laughs> that's, that's a professional cellist, almost every sense of the word. But there's lots of other players who, you know, uh, you might not be the greatest player, but you're an inspired teacher, or you just, you just have made, you're really good at networking, you get a lot of gigs. It's, so it, it's kind of a weird world with a, a lot of sliding scales. Um, it's, there's nothing black and white in my eyes about what a professional is. At this point, I'm, I consider myself a professional cellist because it's, it's my profession. It's also my vocation. It's what I do and it's what I plan to be doing with my life, uh, you know, from here on out. But that doesn't mean that I feel like I'm at the end of my development as a player. It doesn't mean that I'm always satisfied with how I sound as a player, just being completely honest with you. It's that, that to me is a never ending journey. And I hope I don't reach it because if you reach the end, it's where would you go if you, you know, hit a cul-de-sac or something. So I'm glad I don't feel completely happy with myself as a player, but then it's someone asks you, are you professional? It's like, well, you know, there's, there's always room for improvement. So that I hope was an answer to your question. My real answer is I don't like that question. I'm sorry. I, it's a, I've, it's awkward for me. Okay. 
Do I suffer from embarrassment having played for world-class teachers? Never. And I think it's part of my mentality. Um, part of it is just I have a general like shamelessness when I, I just like diffuse things with humor, I think. But also when I went into a lesson, I did, I will say, I usually would make sure that the teacher, if they don't know who I am, then at least I at least give them a heads up like, okay, I've been playing three years and I'm 28. So you, you, you're looking at a man, but you're about to hear a little boy come out of the cello. So be ready for like a, dis, a discrepancy in what you're expecting. But other than that, I'm there to learn and I think what impresses a teacher is not the level you start the lesson at, but once you play for them and they start giving you feedback, your ability to take it in, work with it, comprehend what they're saying, try to make adjustments on the spot, those are the things that will entice a teacher and impress them because, you know, it, it, wherever you're starting, if a teacher's like, oh, if I just... This is a, pl a great plan. It just needs a lot of water. It's really dry and dehydrated and droopy. But if I just water this thing, it's gonna flourish. That I think is really exciting to almost any kind of teacher, I would imagine. So that that's what I would focus on. And it also really takes a lot of pressure off because I, I'm sure the last student that came in, like when I was studying with that guy at the conservatory here in LA, you know, the last student he heard, I'm sure was worlds past me. But if I could sound much better than the last time he heard me and he remembers where I was, you know, three weeks prior, that will impress him, regardless of the fact that the person who just played is twice my skill and half my age. Okay, so you just have to, it's the way you think about it that, that takes a lot of pressure off the situation. Okay, here's a question. How did you plan going from like a, a job, having a job into cello playing and or a university degree. Uh, so I guess what I can talk about is I, I was doing freelance copy editing um, before I just became a full-time student and then a cellist. So that was nice because it was, you know, flexible schedule. So in terms of, you know, starting to make money as a cellist, you know, becoming like a gigging player and all that, I think university is, if you go back to school, that is a, such a great opportunity to basically say yes to everything and get as much experience as possible. So when I was at school, another great thing timing wise, there wasn't an abundance of cellists in the program at the time. And so every time students had, you know, final recital projects, all the composers had recitals and they would hire, you know, the students to play their pieces. I said yes to that. I started taking, you know, local uh, churches would, you know, sometimes find players from the school. So anytime they asked, I, I started playing some church gigs. I was doing, you know, kind of amateur recording sessions for, for composers who were graduating. Anything I could get my hands on, essentially, because I knew that aside from getting technically proficient there's also then the whole kind of blue collar gigging life that you you don't want to show up to a gig and oh yeah this is the first time i've done anything like this let me just feel super awkward and maybe do it wrong you know now that i'm in the real world so i just university it's also a great time to make connections with other players who if they stay in town you know that's like a little network you're building of people who you know, you give each other work and you, you know, some of those composers end up becoming composers and they, they remember you. And so you can, you know, it's just a way to kind of get out there into the real world and transition. So I would say there definitely was a time where I was probably the amount of miles I was driving and the amount of dollars I was making was scarily similar. You know, it was almost one to one. I was just taking everything no matter where it was and but I think it was very tiring and very necessary because I had experience I needed to log before I, you know, kind of graduate. And then you're just in the real world, hopefully getting called to do stuff. Okay. Um, 
Would I have done anything differently? I'm going to save that for a later question. So we'll come right back to that. And I also, I, I should say that I, another thing I was incredi incredibly fortunate about is you know, I've lived my whole life in LA and I did my studying in LA and this is a city that just is kind of teeming with music and musical work at all these different echelons, all the way from like Hollywood, you know, uh, union musicians who play on the, you know, the movie tracks from, you know, Marvel videos, all that kind of stuff, all the way down to little church gigs. It's just teeming with work. So if you live in an area that's not you know, quite as busy and robust in that sense, you have to, you're going to have to think about that and think what, you know, what is available? How can I possibly make connections and, you know, get whatever work, start getting some of the work that's available. Um, okay, here's a, here's an interesting question now. This is, so now I guess we're switching more to like post after your studies. I get the impression most income from cellists is from teaching, um, and then playing gigs, is it, does it pay as well as it's worth in terms of the effort? And is it something that you do for personal preference or is it like, do you just try to find what's most satisfying? So there, you know, to make it as a musician, there's routes you can go. I think mo a lot of people, most people end up doing a little bit of a multitude of things and a lot of one thing, you know. So someone who plays in the LA Phil might also be a teacher on the side to advanced students or something, even though they're a full-time orchestra and one of the best paying orchestras, um, you know, in the nation, they still would probably do some teaching also, maybe some recording sessions. So I think most people do a, a little bit of everything. Teaching, let's just talk in a very general way. Teaching is very steady. If you get a good studio of students, and that's great because you can sort of you s rely on the steady income. Um, gigs pay better than teaching generally, but unless you, you know, make sure that you always are, you always have work, um, then the problem with that with gigs is that you are waiting for them to happen and you're waiting sometimes for the phone to ring. And if it doesn't ring, even if it's better paying, you don't have work. Okay, so I think what my advice would be is to think about what would make you most happy. Some people are just natural teachers. They, they love teaching. Some people see it as like a, a a pretty big chore to have to teach and so they would much rather just be playing gigs um, so each each of these little mini categories is going to have a different skill set set of skills that is important so if you wanted to do say recording knowing your scales knowing your arpeggios knowing the fingerboard and all the patterns and then becoming very good at sight reading those are huge those are so important, okay? Because you, you obviously, uh, well, it's not obvious maybe. In a lot of recording situations, you don't get the music ahead of time, so you just have to see it. They press record and then you just play and it has to be correct. So it's very high pressure. Um, and of course, intonation has to be right on point because it's being recorded. So that's like recording if you're playing you know, church gigs, you might have to learn how to uh, make your own part. Sometimes you'll get, you know, just the chords. And then the melody's written out, it's called a lead sheet, and you have to figure out somehow to like make a cello part out of this group of chords. So you need to know your music theory. And again, you should know the fingerboard, <laughs> obviously. But if you're teaching and you become a full-time teacher, I think that's more about motivating students, giving the right information, being very clear with your concepts. Um, incredible sight reading is, is not gonna be as important if you're primarily a teacher. Um, but that, you know, so, so you kind of have to figure out what you want to do. You also have to figure out if, for example, again, geographically, what's available in your area and, you know, what's possible. So if you decide that, 
your whole purpose on earth was to just play concertos and that's it. You can practice them and get them amazing and then that would be a very tough way to make a career income-wise as a cellist because now you have to find orchestras who want to hire you to play concertos, you know, so it's, I think there's, you have to be practical to a certain extent, but I think, you know, if you're picking something as impractical as cello, you should definitely figure out what would make you happy and just go for that and then be ready to do other things as well. All right, so here's kind of a fun one. Uh, what do I play on now, I, my instrument? And when did I get my first great instrument? So my first great instrument that was kind of professional level, I got, I'd been playing for a couple of years and uh, it was expensive. So my, you know, I had my parents, they were willing to help me, um, you know, make up the, the difference of what I was able to do. Uh, what I play on now is a great cello. It was made in 2018 by a guy named David Foland. Uh, he's in Minnesota. It's a just it's a fantastic instrument. I really really enjoy playing on it. Um, and then uh, bow wise, my main bow is a French bow by a guy named Claude Thomasin. And uh, again, it's it's a fantastic bow and. In terms of when, if in terms of giving advice, uh, what I would say is, it is, it helps. It, it there's no question that a better equipment is going to help you sound better, and it might, in a lot of cases, it makes cello playing easier to do. It helps with, you know, some of the technical stuff you have to do. As soon as possible, if you get serious about this, the better your equipment is. Um, not always the more expensive it is, but the better it is, uh, then you, you know, it just raises the ceiling on what's possible. It inspires you to reach for, you know, better sound. I would give, one piece of advice I would give is that if you're on a budget, like most people would be, I would first consider really doing a major upgrade to your bow because an amazing bow can take a decent instrument and make it sound like a great instrument in a lot of cases. An amazing instrument with not such a great bow, you, it can make it sound like a, a an okay, like a pretty good instrument, but not as good as it could be. So I think the bow has more influence on sound and also a bow that feels really comfortable to you. You're gonna be able to do more and have feel like more free with your arm let's say there's a bow that doesn't skid out easily and, and so you feel just less worried about, you know, losing contact with your with your sound. So I would invest in a bow first. Okay, here's a question. How much do you practice and what was your schedule like in the past? I've done all over the place. It's, it's uh, currently I practice probably like one and a half to two hours when, when concerts, um, classical, concerts come up, I, I practice more. It's just kind of as needed now. Uh, in the past, I practiced like a, a monster. I, I During college, the college years, I was practicing at least four to five hours a day. Um, so this co connects to like the next uh, one of the next questions was about like that 10,000 hour rule. Like, do I believe in that? I do, but I think it's misleading, and I think I would be a good example of how not to do the 10,000 hour rule. In the beginning of your cello journey, there's just a certain amount of reps you need to do, okay? Because it's a new thing. So practicing and just kind of logging hours is going to get you somewhere um, because it, it's just the time you've spent with your instrument in your life. You know, it's like, it's, if you've been playing for a couple months and you practice for 20 hours, if you added another 20 hours, you've been playing cello twice as long for your whole life. So it makes a huge difference up front. I continued that and I was more in a mindset of logging hours and kind of equating, like I'm trying to make my dreams come true because look how many hours I put in. If I could redo it, and, and more in terms of this 10,000 hour rule, 
it's the quality of that practice that's more important. So in shaving off from a five hour day of practice, if I had done two and a half to three hours, but really zoned in on specific problems um, and, and developing specific techniques, it, for example, if you're learning a piece, like taking a passage and dissecting the issues, not just kind of running it and like, oh yeah, it's getting more comfortable. Let me just keep, it seems to be getting better if I just keep trying it over and over again. It, the, the more kind of mentally challenging stuff you can do that, that is teaching you kind of not just how to do what you're doing, but, but why it's now working, what you changed, those kind of things are the things that make that 10,000 hour rule something that I do believe in. But it's 10,000 hours of really quality practice. And that's, there was a couple years there where I think I was definitely heading off in the wrong direction where it was just like punch in. And I wouldn't say it was mindless practice, but it was, it was not the kind of practice that was contributing to like very strong, solid growth. Um, so. That's what I'll say about that. Okay, what's the longest I ever practiced in one section at a time? Probably in 2018, I went to Meadowmount School, um, which was, talk about making opportunities for yourself. I mean, I did the last thing I wanted to do was spend a summer where the average age was like 13 to 18, and I'm 35. It was, I was older than the counselors. It was ridiculous. Luckily, there were older students that I was, my cabin was like much, you know, there was another kid who was 30, I was 35, and then other kids were in their mid to late 20s. I still felt just way too old. But it was my chance to study um, with a world-class teacher there who I had taken lessons with him, and it, it was, I needed it. So I will do whatever. I'll, I'll play next to six-year-olds if it's going to get me where I need to go. So during that period, uh, I was practicing probably six to seven hours a day. You know, I paid my own way, so it's, and it, there's nothing else. My schedule's cleared. I'm in some weird cabin out in the middle of, I think it was Vermont. So there's nothing else to do. So I was just practicing just as much as I could, pretty much, to make the most of the um, time there. Funny enough, I would argue that I got into that mindset again. It's just built into me, and I think I probably would have profited from practicing less and thinking more about what I should be practicing, what I need to be doing, what's going to make me better versus, okay, let me just, I, I, once again, I just got, it's like I got my work card and I just clocked in and then how many hours and clocked out. So it, it crept up on me again, but that's, that's the most I've ever practiced. And it was about two months, the program, and I was doing at least, yeah, probably six to seven hours a day. Um, more than that, you really, my body's probably going to fall apart. That's the other thing as an adult learner, you have to be careful because especially in the early stages, if you have a lot of tension and you're, you, you're getting serious and you're practicing, please put breaks in. I'm saying this not because it's what I do. It's because I suffered the consequences from not doing it. So I can really tell you that you do not want to be on the other end, on the other side of a flare-up of tendonitis, for example, because you just wanted to keep to your schedule and your body's starting to call out in pain, then it's screaming in pain and you're just pushing, okay? So whatever you do with your practice, please, please just put breaks in and listen to your body. And if your body is in pain from cello playing, unless it's because of a callus that you need to form, if it's like tendon pain, you need to change not how much you're playing, but you need to change how you're playing. Here's a question that someone asked, how do I personally make a living? Okay, so what does that look like now? So aside from the odd gig I do, that's you know maybe a church gig I've, I've been doing for a while in the past, or sometimes um, my quartet will do like recording sessions or I get called to do like some kind of recording project. Uh, there, it's basically, uh, my wife and I formed a group called Catus Quartet. It means cat in Latin, C-A-T-T-U-S. And um, we formed that in 2016, and that's basically now where, like, all my gigging is sourced from. We're very, we're super busy. We're actually so busy now that I don't really take other things because 
there's really not much time in my schedule anymore. So what I talked about earlier in terms of like you need to figure out a way if you want to be gigging um, to make sure, you know, you have work to do. That's kind of what my solution was. Um, my wife is a incredible violinist and also a really savvy business person. And I think we both realized quickly that if we started our own group, we would have control to do it the way we think it should be done. And then also, you know, then it's like you're procuring your own work instead of waiting for the phone to ring. So I have my quartet I do, and then I have my teaching, which includes now my other pandemic project was this online course, Cello in 30 Days, which has been going great. Um, so I have that going, and I'll probably come out with more courses, hopefully by the end of the year, if not by the uh, early next year. And then I have my private teaching studio. And between all that and plus these uh, YouTube videos, I'm a very busy person, but I really enjoy everything I'm doing. So it's worth it. Okay. Okay, here's a great question. How many teachers have you had? So I counted it up, and what I consider that is if you've had maybe four or more lessons, and it wasn't just kind of a one-off lesson you took, or like a master class, or like a little three-day seminar kind of thing, you could, I guess you could count that, the latter. But I have had about eight teachers. Um, some I studied for years with, other, others was, you know, maybe a period of weeks or months, but it was consistent enough that I consider it like a, a teacher. Um, and yeah, I, I think I can't say there's a single person I worked with where I didn't learn something truly valuable. Um, so it's, you know, it's, I think the biggest thing, if you're looking for advice for this video, the biggest thing is to not always necessarily find the best teacher you can find in terms of like their pedigree, but it's also, I mean, that can be very important, but also is finding the right teacher for you at the right time. You know, so if you get a teacher who's kind of a polished type teacher where they, they don't get nitty gritty, but they just can take a, a an already formed, you know, rough gem of a player and then polish it into just a beautiful dazzling diamond. If you're not ready for that level, you, you'll you definitely, I think, learn from that teacher, but it doesn't mean you'd learn the same as someone who, for example, is obsessed with fundamentals and just wants to get their players perfectly set up for success, you know, physically and sound-wise you know, that might be a better fit. So teachers are like people, they have personalities, they have strengths and weaknesses. And so you should find ideally the teacher whose strengths are gonna like attack your weakest areas so that you can bring them up and that'll, you know, propel you as quickly as possible. All right, here's another question. Is there anything I would do differently? The number one thing I would do differently, it regards practice and just my approach and in figuring out early enough, when is the cutoff point for, okay, now I'm in this mode of just putting in time, putting in reps and just sort of like driving, you know, and when I, I think I would have ideally earlier than I had by at least a few years started taking my head up, you know, out of this like driving position and look around and be like, okay, what's going to help me? What do I need to work on? How can I practice more efficiently. Um, I just was so obsessive about like the logging in the time, the amount of hours I'm putting in. And eventually that really, I think I still progressed, but it, it was not at the rate it could have been. Okay. So that would be the number one thing to do differently. It's really hard because you're in the moment. You're, you know, they'd say hindsight is always 20, 20. Um, so it's very difficult to judge yourself and try to keep track. That's one thing you could do would be to try to record yourself pretty frequently and listen. It's it, recordings tend to be very honest. And so you can hear, I think I'm doing this now more, but, Oh, look, I've been working on vibrato, but you know what? It's not actually any wider or any faster than I 
it was previously. So even if I'm practicing vibrato every day, the way I'm practicing it needs to change because the results aren't changing. That kind of thinking and, and analyzing the work I'm putting in, that would have been a huge thing. Other than that, I can't say I do a lot differently because again, without this, you know, predestined track that, that for example, kids can get on where they just kind of do the music camps and then they do the conservatory, and then they do the auditions or whatever. Without any of that kind of roadmap to follow, I, I think I learned from every experience I, I did and, and you just kind of have to get out, in my opinion, you just have to get out there and, and try things and do things to, to see what you need. Um, so that's what I would do differently. And then final, final question here. Are there any kind of camps, retreats? Uh, it's a person, her, her kid goes to music school or like music camp in the summer. And now she's wondering, you know, what, is there stuff for adults? There definitely is. I can say in California, one thing I did that was really fun. There was a chamber music, um, festival kind of thing where it's kind of, it accepts all levels. Um, I had three friends, they had a, a, a group, a quartet, and their cellist couldn't make this kind of week long thing and they still wanted to do it. So I just kind of hopped in the position and you work up repertoire and get coaching on it. And then at night we would all just kind of make friends with different groups and different people and just sort of, you know, sight read until we're bleary eyed and we can't even count to four anymore. It was really fun. Uh, it was in Claremont, California. So there are a lot of groups for adult amateurs. If, if this question is about not just enjoying yourself and playing some chamber music and, and experiencing music with other people, but it's more about advancing yourself as a player. I mean, you, what I did is I sought out this one world-class teacher and then, you know, he was on faculty at this place, Meadow Mount. And so I just talked to him and there, there wasn't technically an age limit. So there I was 35 years old at this school for advanced young adults and children, basically. But it's, you know, I, if you don't mind being the odd person out, um, you'd be shocked how understanding a lot of teachers and people are if you're really passionate about something. You know, you can kind of wiggle your way into programs that aren't necessarily designed for you. But, you know, if you get in there and you get the information, me personally, I just don't care. I don't care. Again, I'd play in front of six-year-olds if I had to, if it's going to make me a better player, because that's the goal. So I've actually been thinking about doing kind of a retreat um, myself and be interested to see if any of you guys uh, would have interest in doing something like that. Uh, I've this course that I put out, the Chill in Three Days course, I've now got this robust <laughs> group of students who have uh, enrolled and have gone through it. And I think it would be so fun to just get a big group of adult cellists uh, who are learning, you know, in maybe in the earlier stages and you just go to a location and we would just all learn from each other in group settings like a master class settings and then also private lessons. But just it's amazing how having people kind of doing the same thing that we're all in the same boat, that kind of feeling, putting yourself in a group like that, you it's amazing how much you learn from each other and, you know, something you thought wasn't even possible for a player your age let's say you're in your 60s and you're like well I can't expect to be able to do this and then you see the person next to you just do it you know oh my god you just shifted that how, how do you do that you know and you just try it and you're like oh I can do it you know so it's a lot of those kind of cool moments happen when you get in a group so um yeah let me know if you'd be interested in a retreat like experience for kind of a cello camp for adults so there you go that's kind of a little bit about myself and hopefully some helpful information for those of you who are trying to figure out how to get from where you are to where you want to be in a, in a serious way. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already and happy Thanksgiving.